Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This is Joni Stahl. <sighs> it's so good to be back again. I hope everybody had a nice weekend. Well, I'm well rested and I'm ready to go. So I want to welcome everybody back that uh, frequents to this little green pasture. And I want to welcome all of you that are visitors and new to this channel and new subscribers. It's wonderful to have you here. I want to encourage you to partake in the comment section because lots of fellowship goes on in there. And just remember, I keep it a safe place. And that way, everybody can have true koinonia fellowship where there's just lots of love and hearty, salty discussion and encouraging and prayers. And if you need prayer, please just ask for it. We're a community of saints that believe that our God answers prayer. And by the way, that's what I'll be speaking about today. So let your request be made known, of course, to God first, but here in the comment threads in field notes, because like I said, there's a lot of people that have such fiery hearts for Christ to pray, including myself. And we've seen a lot of people experience some wonderful results from that. So we love you. We welcome you to um, ask for prayer. Okay. And so with that moving on, I want to thank everybody that does pray for this channel and financially supports this channel, all of which I know it is because the Lord moves in his own little section here of the, of the world in this little apartment. So I just humbly want to thank everybody. All of you are so uh, faithful to Jesus Christ, and it is only my ultimate joy, pleasure, privilege, and honor that I could be here. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to get started. Heavenly Father, I come to you this day. I come to you, Lord Jesus, and I want to thank you for another day that in this hour of earthly history, that, Lord, that you can take a little earthen vessel like me and that you can fill me up, that I could pour water into the cups of others that are thirsty. Because it's not me that they're really listening to, Lord. They're here because of you. I'm here because of you. And Lord Jesus, I pray that in all things you would have the preeminence, that you would author and finish this message, that you would touch my heart and touch my mouth and my spirit and my soul, my mind, that as I hear, I will speak just as you heard the Father speak, you spoke. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to take what is of the Lord's and show it to me. And I yoke myself together with you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I yoke myself together with your word, with your Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Lord Jesus. And I pray that this would be a blessing. And that you would bless the hearts of those and ears of those and eyes of those to be open. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about prayer today. And, you know, a friend of mine, Karen, she uh, wrote to me about a week or so ago, probably a couple of weeks ago, and she was wanting, she, she requested, could you do something on prayer? And, you know, I do talk quite a bit about prayer. And I do even have a, a prayer series that you can listen to that I did two years ago. And, you know, and I told her, I said, yes, of course, you know, I'll do it. And I want to pray about it first. And as I was thinking about it for a week, I was going back and forth in my own mind into the Lord saying, you know, Lord, there are a thousand books out there that you can open the book and the ABCs and one, two, threes, how to pray, how to talk, what to say, how to approach, what to do, what not to do. And to me, I look at those all as a menace because you see, let me give you a little background back in the day when Christ called me into prayer. Now I was praying all the time. And I always was prayer. Prayer was easy to me, but a day came where God really started to move in my life and called me really into that room of going deeper with Christ in prayer, not just, and while I was doing it before in my sincerity, there was growth time. And Jesus Christ 
as always, will make a master decision in your life and mind when he decides it's time for you to go to the next step. Because we're to always, Paul the Apostle said that he prayed, his prayer was that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of God, being rooted and grounded in his love, and that we would be fruit-bearing trees. And the Holy Spirit knows just when to change things up. So I'm not going to get into all this detail about what happened here, what happened there. I might weave some things in it while I'm talking about prayer. But just to let you know, prayer is a vast economy. And I see this huge gap. There's like people that really know how to pray and they're really good at it. And there's people on this side that never really pray at all. And they just have people pray for them and they're not really interested in prayer. And then there's this big gap of millions of people that they don't really know how to pray. And so, so much focus is, is on the how to pray. And there's so much self-focus. And it's normal because I remember, now I'm going to inject this. Like I said, I'm going to weave things in and out. And I remember when I first became a Christian, somebody invited me. And I, I just remember like as a baby, I was saying, oh, Jesus, I love you. And um, Lord, help me to be a better this and a better that. And forgive me for this. And, forgive. and so all my, my prayers were what they were supposed to be for my newborn, born again age. But when I started to get older, you know, I started to want to, and I'm reading the word and I'm applying the word uh, to prayer. And so there's this natural movement in the spirit. You notice the spirit, God is always on the move. And prayer is something so absolutely critical and so important. I would say it's like the blood flow of the Christian's life in communication with their God, with our God. The more you communicate with him, who is a real person, the more he's going to draw near to you and communicate with you. But you see, I'm speaking about prayer, this big gap where people, like I said, oh yeah, let me finish my story. So I remember somebody invited me to a Bible study. And so it was at a church and I went and at the end, they said, okay, we're going to uh, pray. And so everybody got in this big circle and and there were some people that were praying. You could tell that they were really good at prayer. They were like just, you know, pouring out their heart to God. It was coming out so beautifully. Then there's somebody else over here doing the same. And all of a sudden my heart started to race because I thought to myself, I don't sound like that. And I'm going to try to remember how she said it. And I remember how he said it. And I remember trying to sound like them and it was a disaster. I remember I was trying to pray and I was stumbling all over and what was simple before and what I enjoyed earlier before and just like a little child turning my face to Christ and looking up to my father in heaven through Christ Jesus, just to pray and tell him I loved him went out the door. And I learned, you know, through situations like that, uh, that there is a lot of focus on ourself, how we sound, what we must sound like to God. Is he really hearing us? What is he thinking when we say something? Um, or there's all these different kinds of things that we are critiquing ourselves on. And I get this picture of like a judgment seat and I see myself as the judge and I see myself in the witness stand and I see a bunch of replications of myself as a jury and everything the judge and the prosecutor is against me and I'm the one going I know I'm guilty for not praying right I just to move right along um the Lord had to deal with me in that because in American Christianity there is such a push to in a competition that you don't realize that you're in. And though you can say, you may say, this may not speak to you. I'm not saying where the seeds land, let them land. But the American church is a competitive church. The people are competitive, they're spiritually competitive in the gifts, in int intellectual knowledge of Christ and um, who holds degrees and what what you know title do you have elder reverend deacon bishop apostle you know 
And, you know, the Lord doesn't pay attention to titles. Jesus made himself of no reputation. He considered it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and, and took on himself the form of a servant and became obedient even to the death of the cross. Oh, sure, they called him master and they called him rabbi. He was always there. But he knew who he was. He knew where he came from and where he was going and what his mission was. So titles to Jesus Christ don't amount to anything. It's the heart that man believeth unto righteousness and to with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. So as I was praying about this, you know, I was talking to the Lord about it and I was like, Lord, I, I, I can take this in a thousand different directions, but how is that going to help people? Am I just going to be sharing information with them? How would you do it? And you know what I thought? I thought about all the ways I've ever just been natural. And that's just talk to you. Not give you another billionth lesson on how to pray. The only person that can teach us to pray is Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit. But there's one thing I want to add today that the Lord made me see very clearly. Like I was seeing through a glass darkly, but for he gave me a flash of seeing. And, and the, here, okay, how do I want to put it in words? You see, here's here's something I believe the Lord, um, I'm going to try and put it in words. You know how you hear something in the spirit and you want to be careful how you put it? Um, I don't want to put words in his mouth. So understand I'm trying to put into words what I fully understand stood in my spirit. This is not a thus saith, but what the best I can in my, hu my human best <laughs> filled with his Holy Spirit, as Moody says. Is that the Lord, I believe what I was understanding from him, he was saying in my in my heart. Um, the reason why people have a hard time praying is they have a, tr they, they have trouble seeing and knowing that I'm already there, that my presence is already there. And I started to really think about his presence. And, you know, we know that he has his spirit in his presence. We have felt the presence of the Lord. If you haven't, many of us have. I pray you will feel the presence of the Holy Spirit upon you. I'll pray for that at the end, that you will know his presence. Um, but you know when his presence comes in. And he, in his presence, when his presence comes in, there, it, it, what I call it is the felt presence. Uh, because his presence is always there. He never takes his Holy Spirit from you or his, or his presence unless you are gr grievously and egregiously sinning against him. Then your sins will separate you from God. But he'll always work by his grace and power to draw you with bands and cords of love back to himself through his mercy. I want to say that because I believe as long as people are alive, uh, never give up on praying for them, no matter how evil or wicked they are, unless somehow the Lord makes it very clear to you, you're done praying for them. Maybe he's going to have someone else pray for them. So don't ever think God gives up on anybody. Anyway. Um, but I was thinking about the presence of the Lord, you know, and his presence, sometimes you'll feel his presence come in when you're worshiping and you're like, oh man, like it's just pouring down and you're worshiping in his presence. And sometimes during a prayer meeting or you're in prayer, his solemn presence will come in and you don't want to speak. Haven't you ever been there with a group of people where you won't even dare speak? You don't want to speak. You can't speak. I mean, you could force it, but you don't want to. And it's really something when he allows his felt presence to come in. And uh, then there's presence, you know, where he comforts you. And there's this presence of joy. And and uh, there's he, he comes to even his presence to uh, convict you. And to, you know, tap you on the shoulder a little bit and say, don't do that. And so he has a way of letting his presence be known in your conscience um, he'll let his presence be known in the atmosphere, um, in your room that you're in, or even with a group, you could be out somewhere with people and all of a sudden you feel the presence and no one else does. 
and you can hear the spirit saying to you, get away from these people. And you may not hear audible words, but his presence, it's so highly spiritual. You don't need to hear audible words. You just know he's speaking to you. It's like Paul the Apostle when he was on his way to Damascus to go and go on a, you know, a mission to go drag Christians to prison and kill them if he could. And when Christ appeared to him at Damascus at noonday, um, it was said that only Saul heard his voice, but everyone else just said it thundered. So God knows how to speak to you. He knows how to speak to you. And it doesn't need to be with the earth shaking. It doesn't need to be through constant prophetic running after the words of other people. Um, there comes a time where God really wants to speak to you. And there are some of you that write to me and say, but I never hear God speak to me. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit. I'm just kind of putting out there what I'm going to touch upon today. And so it's about his presence. And I need to talk about this because I know in my spirit, that is really what God wants you to hear today. Because see, a lot of people pray, I have done it. Like I'm not sitting here on some bed soapbox looking down and going oh everybody i was there i remember like in my youth and many times even in terror i was like where are you god where are you right i mean joseph said it when he was in prison um moses said it i mean there's all these people through the bible because they were real humans they were real humans yes they did mighty awesome feats of power through the lord but they were as human as you and i you know, Elijah hid in a cave. He's like, I might as well just die, okay? And do you think the Lord spoke to him at that moment? He didn't hear the Lord's voice. He just sent an angel to give a piece of bread and some water. He was so depressed. Sometimes you can't hear from the Lord because you're depressed. Sometimes you're so angry with God, you don't want to hear from him at that time. Or sometimes you're pressing so hard on him to hear from him that in that pressing, it actually blocks the way from, there's something that blocks. Do you follow what I'm saying? Let me, let me try to explain that. I can't really explain it perfectly, but there's times that I've been like hanging on the Lord going, Lord, I want to hear from you. Lord, speak to me, Lord Jesus. Lord, your servant is listening and nothing but silence in drop silence for months until I realized, Joni, the Lord will talk to you when he's ready to talk to you. He's not just going to talk to you because you are begging him to hear his voice. Joni, he is teaching you to believe on him that you haven't seen. Like Moses said, he, he endured because he believed on him who was invisible. And, you know, it says that in uh, 2 Corinthians, I think it's 4, uh, 416, it says, though, while we look at the things uh, not seen, um, let, let me look at that because I want to say it perfectly. Um, second, I'm just going to say it. While we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are unseen are eternal. So what Jesus is training you and I to do is to believe on him whom he hath sent. He is alive. He is in heaven. It says that Jesus Christ, uh, in 1 uh, John 4, 9, I believe, has not entered into holy places made with hands, which is a figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for you. And, you know, when we read that word, we we take that word in. But, you know, we could receive the word, but not with power. You know, it says in the word, Paul says, but I will come unto you. And I will, but, you know, if, if the Lord wills, I will come unto you. But I will not know the speech of them that are puffed up, but the power for the word of God is not for, for the uh, word of God is not in word, but in power, meaning you can hear the word spoken old and new Testament. You can hear audible words, but it's powerless. You're hearing it. There's no, it's like watchman knee. Watchman knee was invited. He was in your, he was in England. He was invited 
to a, a Bible, uh, to a church. And after the uh, service, the people, some men, a couple people asked him, or a person asked him, what did you think of it? And he said, there was a lot of light, but there was no life. So you want that power. You want that power. But you see, there's such a focus on how we sound, how we say it, how we apply it. Um, we read books on this and books on that. And trust me, I read With Christ in the School of Prayer, best book I ever read. I read tons of books, but you want to know what it came down to? The hidden man of my heart, where Christ is seated. It says in Psalm 46, 1 through 2, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in, in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. See, we see a God of yesterday. We, could, we see a past, right? We can look back and say, I see God there and there and there. I remember when I prayed that he rescued me and this and that. And we can go through our life and we can see a God of yesterday. <clears throat> and then we look into our future. And though we don't know the future, we say, well, I'm going to believe the Lord for when this comes around next June. And I'm going to believe the Lord because I believe in the fall when this and this happens. And I hear from this, that, and, that, and the other. But see, what is difficult, what the Holy Spirit was showing me, what is the stumbling block, block to prayer is the inability to really grasp that Jesus Christ is a very present help in time of trouble. You know, I want to keep going. I was looking at Genesis 28 today. This came to mind. This is after Jacob tricked. This is after uh, Jacob tricked Isaac, his dad, and he was on the run for his life. Because Esau wanted to kill him. I'm not going to read the whole story. You can read it yourself. But from verse 10, it says, <clears throat> And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. A certain place that place and he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold the angels of god ascending and descending on it and behold the lord stood above it and said i am the lord god of abraham thy father and the god of isaac and the land whereon thou liest to thee i will give it and to thy seed and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all places. Never notice that he's talking about places. He lighted upon a certain place and in that place, right? So then he says it in all places whither thou goest i will keep thee in all places so not only i will be with he will be with him he said i will keep you in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land and he goes on to say i will not leave thee until i have done that which i have spoken to thee of and jacob awaked out of his sleep and said surely the lord is in this place and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And you know, when I thought about that this morning, I said, I said to myself, looking at it, okay, so here's this guy, a tent dweller. He was a smooth man. Jacob means supplanter. Um, and now he running, he's running for his life. Now he's no longer a tent dweller. He's all alone. Everything he's ever known in his life is gone. He's a hunted man. This looks like this is probably the first night that he was alone. 
He had nothing. He was stripped down. He only had rocks for a pillow. But that's when God spoke to him. God didn't speak to Jacob when he was in the tent. He spoke to him when he was in the dark. And he spoke to him with his head on a pillow in a dream. And he said to him, I am with thee and I will keep thee at all places that you go. I won't leave thee. And he says, until I've done that, which I've spoken to thee of, you know, Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of your faith. He is going to finish what he started in you. And prayer, I'm going to get to the prayer aspect of that, but I need to solidify some things in your mind about his presence before you pray another prayer. Because it is vital for you to understand that just because you don't feel his presence or never have felt his presence or haven't felt his presence for a long time, that doesn't mean his presence is not there. He says he fills heaven and earth. Let's keep going. In Genesis 3, 8, it says, in the Garden of Eden, it says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. You know, God has a presence. Satan knows all about his presence. His kingdom knows all about his presence. And so Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to live in you, which is his presence. His presence is with you. Don't lean, don't externalize your walk with Christ in terms of prayer. When you pray to him, he says, when it says he is a very present help, it doesn't say he is a present help in time. And it said, oh, he's very present. In other words, he's more present in your life. He's more present in the thing that is grieving you. He's more present than the last verbal beat down that you got from somebody. He's more present in every loss that you're experiencing right now and the ones to come in your life, in my life and everybody's life. Jesus said in this life, you will have tribulation, but in me, you'll, you'll have life. He said there, you know, he said, be of good cheer, be of good comfort because I've overcome the world. And it says in me, well, it says that we are in Christ and Christ in us. And Christ is in God. So how is it that his presence can be far from us? That would be like you trying to get away from yourself. It's impossible, right? Like it sounds ridiculous. Can you get away from you? No. That would be like Christ denying himself. I know that pain has a way of shutting your ears and making you go down. But I've been there. I can tell you, I know I've been there where I have not felt the presence of the Lord. But something in me said, I don't care if I don't feel your presence because I know what your word says. You said you would never leave me nor forsake me. I remember saying that while I was choking on tears. I don't mean to be you know, dramatic, but I remember saying you're all I have. Because there were times in my life where there was not another soul to turn to. And the ones that I thought I could turn to departed from me. Now, I don't hold them in unforgiveness. God allowed it to happen so that I fully learn to lean on Christ and let people go. Just let them go. In Exodus, Moses got to the point where he was getting tired. I mean, he's one person and he has, you know, thousands and thousands of people. He's the only person hearing from God and telling people, this is what the Lord's telling me. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. We're not going to do this. Here's the laws. Here's this. Here's that. And it got to the point where he was saying, look, these are your people. These are your people. Now, therefore, I pray, if I found grace in your sight, show me now thy way that I may know you, that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And God said to him, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. In 
In Psalm 1611, it says, Thou will show me the path of life. In, your, in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. In Psalm 5111, it says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. See, God does have a presence. And when we find that his presence has been gone for a long time, it does affect our prayer life. You know, it makes us feel like, have you ever been on a road trip where you're like, oh my gosh, we've been on the road for like five days, like driving through Texas, like three days, and it's a long, flat road, and there's nothing to look at on the I-40. And it gets grueling. You're like, oh, or you're coming down through California. There's this one road. And it feels like you're going to go absolutely crazy because it's straight, it's flat, and it's 10 hours to get home. And you just feel like, I just got to, you, you want to get home? Press on. Keep pressing on. Focus. You're going to get there. And eventually we get home. That's how I feel about prayer. Like, if it's my if it's a direct line to God and it is why would I short myself of it? And it gets to the point where and I, and I know I'm putting a lot of myself in this and I can't help it but I'm just sharing. It seems like the more you pray the more you want to pray. You know Jesus Christ is the door, right? He says I am the door. Any man that cometh in me shall find life and shall go in and out and find pasture you know, refers to himself as a door. And I believe that door is truly a door into another world. That's why when it says, ask, seek, and knock, you're knocking at a door that opens up to another world. And he said, when you ask, ask God for what you want. I hear, I hear, you know, I, I got so messed up, you guys, before trying to like, oh, I want to learn how to pray, you know. And there's people that go, well, when you pray, never say this, but only say that. And then you listen to somebody, ne oh, no, no, no. Then they'll say something flip side. Oh, no, no, no. You want to always say that, but don't do that. Then you read in a book. Prayer should never be about you personally. You should always just pray about other people and let, let it go and let God be God. You know, I'll tell you something. Yesterday in the Word... Um, I was looking at Psalm 140, 142, and I was thinking about hearing people, even recently I heard somebody say, you know, we get so involved in praying for ourselves and just praying for things that we want. Um, and we can't, we should never do that. That's not what God's throne is for. And I was like, really? Because when I read Psalms, all I constantly hear is David saying, my I, me, I, me. <laughs> Listen to this. In Psalm 142, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 times in seven verses. And I didn't even add the word me that happened in there. 1, 2, 3 four times, five times, six times. So let me just count that. I want to see it on top of what I just said. So there is, when he added me, I just said my. But there's I, my. I mean, there's like six, seven times that he says me. And then there's these eyes that he says, one, two, three, four five, six. Let me just read it. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice, he says twice. With my voice, with my voice. Unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. 
in the way wherein I walked, have they laid a snare, privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and behold, there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living, attended to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Wow. So when somebody tries to tell you or you feel like, I don't know, because people say, well, I, I don't like to always pray for myself. I feel bad. Really? Well, David did it the entire Psalms. So did Asaph, Ezra, Heman, Jeduthun, the sons of Asaph, every one of them spoke about the pain they were feeling, how they were betrayed. And you know who went? I don't see anybody going for David and saying, I'm here. There's nothing, nothing in the Psalms that says, I'm here, Lord, on the behalf of King David. And he's been feeling very sad lately. This is personal. This is personal. When you know God, when you know personally Jesus Christ, you don't want anybody to get out of your way. You want to knock them down. You have business with the king. You tell him yourself. You go and you cry unto the Lord with your voice, with your voice. And you make your supplication unto him. Pour out your complaint before Jesus Christ and show before him your trouble. When your spirit is overwhelmed within you, he's going to know your path. He's going to direct your path and tell you which way to go. And he sees where in the way you walked and people that lay snares for you in all different kinds of ways. He knows when you look on your right hand and he sees that there's no one that knows you. There's no one. There's no refuge for you. You're stuck in something. You're stuck in a household where everybody treats you like dirt. You're in a dead end job where your co-workers and your boss mock you and they're full of the enemy. He knows. It says he cried unto the, then he says again, I cried unto you, O Lord. And he tells us what he said. You are my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. See, a real relationship is communi communication. The less you talk to somebody, you don't know them. Jesus is real. He's alive. He is the living, true God. And he lives and reigns and rules as the great high priest, seated in heavenly places far above all of this. And he wants to hear from you. Don't, you know, it says forgetting what is behind, reaching for the things that lie ahead, pressing, ever pressing to the upward call of our prize in Christ Jesus the Lord. Notice that forgetting, leaving, for, forgetting. What is it? Forgetting it's Philippians 3 10. No, 3 uh, 20. Um, forgetting what is behind. Forgetting those things that are behind and reaching. So forgetting, reaching, pressing. You notice that with the Lord, there's there's a, there's life to it. There's life to it. It's a constant. It's not forget the things that are behind and reach forth to the things that lie ahead. Ever press. He's, it's an I-N-G at the end of those words. It's always happening because you're moving. You should be moving. See, the enemy wants to get us so caught up in looking at our fallen nature self. Of course, we're going to be cast down. That's what the devil does. He doesn't want you to pray. He doesn't want you to look beyond yourself. Because see, faith, faith's eyes look away from yourself to God. It lifts you out from this world. You know, I want to share, you some, share with you something that my mother wrote to me. And I will never forget it. I'm like, oh, I am going to write that down. And my mother had written to me a little note and she sent it to me. And she said, and this was in July 25th, 2015. And she said, hi, Joni, feeling as you do about our crazy world. The best thing for you to do is go directly to God in prayer. He knows what you want before you ask. 
He has all the right answers. Friends will sympathize, but God will remove that cloud over your head. Remember, we cannot control what goes on outside of us, only our response to it. That's where God comes in. Jesus said, I am with you always to the end of days. His spirit surrounds you and his hand goes out to you. Just let it all go. He's in charge, not you. So as you go through the day, keep this in mind. And he's so easy to access. Isn't that great? I love you. Easy access. Many of us get days like this when we see and hear the world's troubles. What you must do is to step out of this world and take his hand. He's our father and he is in control. Isn't that great? You know, I want to keep going. Joshua, it says, after the death of Moses, jo Joshua 1, 1 through 5, it says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, into the land which I do give to them, even to the children of every of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, as I said unto Moses, I have given to you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. You see, Joshua did hear God speak, but he everybody had to hear what Moses had to say. We had to hear, they had to hear what Moses heard God speak, and Moses would speak to them. But now God is saying, now you're going to hear me for yourself. Moses is dead. And as I was with him, so I'm going to be with you. I will be with you. I won't fail you. He didn't just say, I'll be with you. Now go on. He said, I will be with you. I will not fail you. No, I'm not going to forsake you. You see, a present God, when you pray, is powerful. It is the now faith. It's now, today, this moment. When Jacob was blessing his sons, he said to Asher, as the day is, so shall thy strength be. See, God knows already what you need. And God wants to, God, he wants you to talk to him. You know, Jesus says, I'm, all, I'm with you always, even into the end of the world. You know, there's a friend, he died and went to heaven. And this guy really struggled. And I remember he lived across the street from me. This was many years ago. And he really struggled very badly. And, um, and just with, you know, um, habits, sinful habits that plagued him and tormented him. And I remember him always wanting to talk to me about the Lord. And, and a lot of times he would come to me and feel so bad. He'd be like, you're not going to believe it. I just feel like I'm such a disappointment to God. And, and then I would do my best to go, no, you're not a disappointment to him. And, you know, we would have this back and forth, right? And then I didn't see him for a while. And one day I, he, I was outside watering and I'd always see him. He'd always come walking like this, you know, and I see him come and he goes, and he'd always have his arms folded and he'd go. Hi, Joni. How are you today? And I'd be like, I'm doing good. And he said, yeah, well, he went on to say, you know, I was really struggling. And I mean, he was describing a moment like a crisis of faith. And so, but it was just set, like, I felt like he was there like under a minute because he came over, he walked over like, do, 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 do. And he said, hi, Joni, how are you? And I go, I'm doing good, you know? And he goes, well, I just wanted to tell you something. You know, we have had hard times. And I have been having some better days. So with the utmost confidence, I just took my fist and slammed it into the table and shouted, Jesus Christ is my Savior and Jesus Christ is my Lord. I just wanted to share that with you. And he turned and walked away. And I never forgot that. Because you see, something happened in that man with that struggling, with that wrestling, where his prayer wasn't, dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today and on bended knee, he just, something made him want to slam his fist on the table and say, ah, 
This is how I feel. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is my Savior. And it was important for him to tell me that. You see, prayer, prayer, we think, we think we have to have this ethereal moment where we're in the presence of God and we have to work up something to bring his presence in. But I'll tell you something right now. In the worst of my days, it felt like the further away, the further I went away in terms of like, not, I'm not talking a departure from the faith. I'm not talking about being backslidden. But there were times in my life that I was so broken. I felt like I was like a groping about in darkness, like a twice dead plucked up by the roots life. And you know, the further I went away, when I look back is when the, that's the closest I felt his presence when I looked back. You know, I think of that Psalm writer who says, I lift my eyes, the clouds grow thin. I see the blue above it. And day by day, this pathway smooths since first I learned to love it. I want to encourage you today that you are on a path that leads home. And I hope it's the narrow path. The narrow path is the hardest path, but it's the only one that leads to heaven. And I believe it's single file. And I believe the gate is the cross. And Christ goes with you. He do, you don't just pass through a gate like you're going on some wild rides, the Matterhorn at Disneyland. When you go through that door, you enter into another world while you're in this world. And when you pray, you pray from your heart. You know, often people say to me, Joni, how, how do I pray? Teach me how to pray. And I say to them, what is, out of three things that you can think of in your heart, what is the most important one, the most powerful one? Don't tell me. But in your own self right now, what is it? They always know. Do you know what it is? And they always say 100% of the time, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what which one it is. I said, that's your prayer. That's your prayer. That's your prayer. God said he will answer you. He didn't say when, but God will answer you in his own style. Jesus Christ doesn't play games with your life. We don't understand fully who he is. He's unsearchable and he's past finding out. But for goodness sakes, if he says, ask, seek, knock. When he says, when you pray, when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray, you go into the, in your prayer closet, you shut the door and you pray in secret and your father who seeth in secret will reward you openly. But when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their vain repetition. For the father knows when you pray, remember the father knows what things that you have need before you even ask. And remember his presence in Psalm 139. And I'm going to say this, and I don't want this uh, message to go any longer. But um, I'm sorry, you guys, let me just pop over there. It's not far. Um, he says, whither shall I go from thy spirit? Psalm 139, verse 7. Or whither shall, shall I flee? From thy presence if i ascend up into heaven thou art there if i make my bed in hell behold thou art there if i take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea even there thy hand shall lead me and thy right hand shall hold me and he goes on to say even when he was in his mother's womb as god's eyes were in there you see, don't believe the lie. Don't believe even your flesh that or the enemy that comes around. He sees your weakness. Where is God now? Where is your God now? Look at what you're look at what you're facing. God, God is the author and finisher of your faith. Let me just tell you right now, 
The moment you say, Jesus, you have just involved him and he hears your voice. Remember I said in that Psalm, with my voice, with my voice. If you have something you want to say, say it and say it well. Mean what you say. You're not going to hurt his feelings. He knows why you're saying it. He knows. And let me tell you something. Before I go, I remember one time I was having so much trouble getting something out. I was so hurt. I was so upset. But I was having so much trouble. I felt like I was trying to punch my way out of a paper bag, out of a wet paper bag. And I kept saying, Lord, I no, God, I pray. And I felt like I was just entangled in the wilderness. And I, and I, I was so, I had so much in me that wanted to explode like a wine bag that had no vent that had wine in it that wanted to explode. But I was so in my head thinking, well, don't say it like that. You're going to disrespect the Lord. Well, don't say it like that. Then you'll have to apologize to the Lord because you're going to say it like this and you might have been. Finally, I heard within my soul, my spirit man, I heard the Lord say to me, whatever you're, I gave you, no, he said, I gave you those feelings. So with, so that with the heat and the intensity of those feelings, they that will become the force behind your prayer to me and so when you speak to me and you are p powerfully hurt with that power you come to me and you tell me you see he's not a god that we have made after our own image he's not a god that we made with our own hands he's not a god after our own understanding the god that created this universe the god who, who said uh, he in chapter Genesis in Genesis chapter one, where it said in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. You know, I think of that. I say, you know, that darkness that was upon the face of the deep, you know, a soul, a soul that's unsaved really is that description they're without form and they're void and darkness is upon their face and the face of their deep. But the Holy Spirit of God moves upon the, the face, broods upon it, that life, and says, let there be light. And that God that created heaven and earth created you. And even if you're not saved and you're watching this, the God that created you loves you. And if you are saved, he is with you. You know what says, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. And if we have no faith, he abideth faithful still, for he's not able to deny himself. So even when you don't have faith, because sometimes things get so heavy, you're like, I don't even have a shred of faith anymore. It's not because you left God. It's because sometimes there's such devastation. You, you're, you feel like your soul got ripped out of your body and thrown off a cliff and got ran over by a train, then put back into your body. God doesn't expect you. Don't feel like you have to live up to some expectation to sound a certain way to God, to say certain words to him. Goodness sakes, if you were talking to me and you were saying certain words that you thought I wanted to hear, I'd say, this discussion's over. Come back when you really want to talk to me. And then we'll talk because you're talking to a real person. How much more? when you're talking to the true and living God. So let your requests be made known. Cry unto the God of your life. Pour out your complaint before him. God is a refuge unto us. And he will author and he will finish your course on this earth with joy. But never give up praying because you think 
His presence is nowhere to be found. I tell you the truth, his presence is in you. His presence is about you. And he vivifies himself by his spirit to your spirit. And he is more real than you and I could ever imagine, for we do see through a glass darkly. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. And he will speak to you in beautiful ways that are past finding out. Have a beautiful day.